the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself. Amen. Thank you so much, praise team, or part of the praise team. I enjoyed that. I hope you folks listen by so various means of social media. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Hope you got up early enough to see the snow this morning. I saw some on the ground, saw some falling just a little bit. Uh, 
And I thought, well, I don't want to offend any weather people, but they had called off any chance of snow here on the weather report that I had seen. That was the Weather Channel. Uh, they had called off all the snow, then we got some. Uh, Wesley Price told me yesterday they were calling for about three inches in Franklin. Uh, so I'm going to get up with him later and see. But uh, what was on the ground a little bit was pretty. I think we've had three snows now. You add it all together, we got about a tenth of an inch. Maybe snow. We've got three dustings is about all we've had uh, all year. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a big snow fan. I love to see it, but I hate to drive in it. And uh, I've, I've been up in Ohio where they've had serious snows, two feet of snow and super cold temperatures. And, uh, man, I, I understand. Anthony, the older I get, the colder I get. And I understand why seniors move to Florida now, Robbie. I really do. Uh, and, you know, the thing about it is just when we need our hair most, we don't have it anymore. Uh, so we had to wear toboggans and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, it, uh, it was pretty this morning. Uh, I can see the sun trying to come out through the front windows there. So the sun's going to shine. It's going to get about 50 degrees today. We're going to have a great day. I want to preach to, to you this morning, uh, preach for you, or uh, preach some stuff that the Lord's already shared with me, and then I'll share it with you. But it's just simply called Hope from God's Word. Hope from God's Word. And what God's been showing me in this time of pandemic uh, is that uh, people need encouraging. Uh, I mean, this is going on now. It's uh, 11 months uh, since, or almost 11 months, like in a week, uh, till Governor order, uh, till Governor Cooper ordered uh, the first, uh, you know, stay-at-home order kind of thing, March 14th uh, last year, and uh, so it's been 11 months now. Nobody that I talked to it in the early days thought it would go on this long, uh, but uh, and so it can get depressing and discouraged. I mean, it's you know, people, it's it's real. People are getting sick. People are dying, uh, but uh, you know, there's good news on the horizon. We've got. Uh, one, uh, actually two different vaccines now. I don't know which one's better. And, uh, you know, they're, they're slowly getting that to where everybody can get it, I think. Um, I've heard that the survival rate, if you get COVID, is 99%, over 99%. Uh, well, that's probably a whole lot better chance I've got than getting over this administration. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in for nothing. But, uh, I mean, it's a you know, 99% chance you'll get through it. Uh, and, and survive from it. So that's, that's a pretty good number there. And, um, but you can get discouraged because of all the sickness and, and the death. But not only that, the restrictions and the mask and, uh, you know, stay-at-home orders and uh, six feet apart and all these th different things and wash your hands 74 times a day and all these things that come along with this. And I want you to know there's hope in God's Word. And that's what the Lord's been trying to lead me to and, and, and to uh, help me to share with others. Uh, hope, uh, messages of hope and encouragement. That's what I want to do today. Psalm 119, if you're here with us and have your Bibles with you, if you have them there with us, uh, uh, if you're watching by way of uh, Facebook or YouTube later, uh, Psalm 119, Psalm 119. Now, I'm going to read verses 49 through 56, and then I'm going to have a, a lengthy introduction and a short message, all right? Psalm 119, verse 49, Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. In that very first verse there, caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. I remembered, there's that word remember again. I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night and have kept thy law. This I have because I kept thy precepts. May God add his blessings and understanding to the reading of his precious, precious word. What are some things we know about Psalm 119? Well, the first thing comes to mind, it is the longest chapter in the Bible. Anybody here tell me how many, without looking, tell me how many verses it is? I saw Anthony looking. <laughs> 176 verses in this one Psalm. Now, if you think that the Psalms are songs, which most of them are, 
uh, and this one would have uh, about 22 stanzas. This would be a long song. I remember years ago going to a funeral. I won't say who it was for. I wasn't officiating. It was at a it was at one of the local funeral homes, and I had gone to attend, and I came in not late, but later than I like to be, and I slipped in the back there, very back row, right behind some of our church members. Pat Millis was there, Anita Sharp was there, uh, my sister-in-law, Debbie Gossett, was there, and, and I slipped into that funeral, and uh, the fellow who died, he's just an old country fella, and he liked cowboys and all that kind of stuff, and the preacher that was doing the funeral was a cowboy preacher from a cowboy church, had a bolo tie, kind of like Roy Duncan, you know, and, and he did a really good job, but uh, the family had picked out the songs, and uh, he said, well, he said, the family wanted this song played right here, and uh, Robbie, they started playing, uh, it's a Leonard Skinner song, Free Bird, I think is what it's called, and uh, Donnie, I looked up at my sister-in-law sitting right in front of me. I said, surely they're not going to play the long play version. And I heard whoever the lead singer for Leonard Skinner is, you know, that's a live version. I heard him say, what song is it you want to hear? And he said, I heard it then. And I knew that it was the long play version. And I knew that that version was 14 minutes long. And I said, surely they're not going to play that. And they were 10 minutes into the song. And that cowboy preacher got up there and said, right in the, you know, in the song, he said, well, I think that's enough of that. And uh, somebody in the family stood up and said, preacher, there's four more minutes. Let it go. And so he let it go. But if you put this to music, uh, 176 uh, verses in this song and uh, 22 stanzas, it would probably be a lengthy song. What else do we know about it? Well, the psalmist used this, uh, this psalm to comfort himself and meditate on the Word of God. I'll, I'll say more about it in a minute, but there's lots of things in here about the Word of God. But the Bible Knowledge Commentary said this, the psalmist was persecuted by men of rank and authority who ridiculed his beliefs, seeking to put him to shame and make him give up his faith. But he strengthened himself by meditating on the word of the Lord, which to him was comfort, his prized possession, his rule of life, and his resource for strength, all of which drove him to desire it, the word, even more. What else do we know about the Psalm 119? It's written as an acrostic. Uh, alpha, that is to say alphabetically. And it's written, if you were to take the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, uh, each uh, grouping of eight verses would begin with one of those letters of the Greek alphabet. Matter of fact, the subtitles are those Greek, uh, the, the Greek alphabet, you can spell each letter out and you have the name of each letter, that's where you get the subtitles for these 22 sections in these 176 verses. Now, <coughs> if this were to be written in English, we would no doubt have 26 groupings, and it would be from A to Z to kind of give you an idea. So it's, it's the Hebrew alphabet. If we use the English alphabet, it would be from A to Z. So let's look at something. What else do we know about this psalm? One more thing. Um, one writer said that he said, the psalm is likely a collection of prayers and meditations on the Word of God. And the Word of God is referred to in 10 different ways, 10 different synonyms in this passage. The word law, now we're talking about uh, in, in, uh, just in Psalm 119, okay? Just in this one chapter. The word law is mentioned 25 times, all singular. The word word mentioned 30 times in the singular, four times plural, saying one time in the singular, commandment or commandments, two times in the plural, uh, and the word is commands, and then one time in the singular. Uh, statutes, 22 times, uh, in the 22 times in the singular, or actually, excuse me, in the plural. Judgment, 18 times plural, four times singular. Precepts, 21 times, always plural. Testimony, 22 times in the plural, one time in the singular. Way, 12 times in the singular, six times in the plural. You say, well, that's not really the way. That doesn't sound like the Word of God. Well, it is a term describing the pattern of life marked out by God's law. That's what it is in the original language. It's a term describing the pattern of life marked out by God's law, God's word. So he shows you the way in his word. And then the last one is kind of similar to that. It's the word path and it's used two times and it's always used 
in the singular. Now, not only do you have all those words for the word word, and I'm talking about finding hope in the word of God, but several of these grouping, now remember there's 22 of them, there's 22 letters in the Greek, in, excuse me, the Hebrew alphabet, and there's uh, 20 of these groupings that uh, talk about different things being done by God's Word. I'll just give them to you quickly. Verses 9 through 16, cleansing by God's Word. Verses 17 through 24, appreciation of God's Word. Verses 33 through 40, loyalty to God's Word. Verses 41 through 48, salvation through God's Word. Verses 57 through 64, obedience to God's Word. Verses 65 through 72, trust in God's Word. And 73 through 80, hope in God's Word. Verses 81 through 88, God's Word is faithful. 89 through 96, God's Word is sure. 97 through 104, God's Word is sweet. Uh, 105 through 112, God's Word is light. Remember, it's a light, it's a lamp. Uh, 113 through 120, God's Word is awe-inspiring. Verses 121 through 128, vindication from God's Word. Verses 129 through 136, God's Word is wonderful. 137 through 144, God's Word is righteous. 145 through 152, God's Word is true. Praise God. Verses 153 through 160, love for God's Word. 161 through 168, rejoicing in God's Word. 169 through 176, deliverance by God's Word. And I intentionally left out verses 49 through 56 because that's my text today. And this is where we find hope from God's Word. And I want to tell you, if there's ever a time when our country, our nation, our world, even our community needed hope, we need hope. Right now, somebody without hope, they're pretty much hopeless, aren't they? And they're helpless. But right now, I tell you folks, our people in our church, our community, we need hope. And one of the places we can find hope is in God's precious Word. Now, let me, I said a lot about this word hope. Let me define it uh, according to Psalm 119, verse 49, how it's used here. It comes from a Hebrew, Hebrew word that carries the main idea of waiting. Now, now, hang on with me. It can mean waiting patiently. It can mean to wait trustfully. But it also means to stay. To stay. To, to stay in one place. Not to turn tail and run when things get rough. When you're in the midst of a pandemic. When the devil is attacking. Don't you ever run from the devil. Because if you do, he's going to fill your backside with fiery darts. Remember Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, talks about the devil throwing those fiery darts. Well, when you look at all the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse, uh, verse, you know, beginning at verse number 10 there, all the way through verse 18, it talks about putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, and your loins girt about with truth. The only thing not protected is your backside. So you don't want to run from the devil when you're going through something like this. So this word means waiting patiently, waiting trustfully, but to stay, not turn tail and run. When you look at Ephesians, uh, the latter part of verse 13, chapter 6, the latter part of verse 13, and the first word in verse 14, the writer said, Paul says this, he said, having done, he's talking about put all the armor of God on, and then he said, having done all to stand, stand. And it's in two different verses. People miss that sometimes. Having done all to stand, man, take a stand, make a stand. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the old song says. And we certainly love the old hymns around here as well. So we're talking about uh, taking a stand for God, having hope in God's Word. One more thing in introduction, and we're going to get into a very short outline. But how can we find hope? In God's Word. How can we find hope even in these eight verses here, verses 49 through 56? And I've noticed, and I'll say more about it in the context of the message, but it says here that the psalmist remembered. He remembers, says it three different times, talking about remembering things. Uh, in verse 49, 52, 55, I think if we remember the Lord and remember His Word as we battle through this pandemic, I think God's Word will get us through. Matter of fact, when you look up 
in Ephesians, I didn't, I didn't jot this down or, or mark this or anything, but when you look up Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse, when you read about putting on all the armor of God, uh, let, me, let me share something with you. Talk about putting on the whole armor of God. And it says, uh, wherefore, verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation, and listen, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only offensive weapon listed in all, all the armor. It's the only offensive weapon. He says, take unto you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we can use the Word of God to find hope and comfort and strength, but also we can use the Word of God to attack the enemy. Because when, when Jesus had been baptized and then immediately he was led into the wilderness for 40 days for fasting and he was in hunger, or he would say, we would say hungry, and the devil came to tempt him. And uh, three different times the devil, uh, I should say, put him to the test. Three different times the devil tempted him, however you want to phrase that. But every time, what did he use to combat Satan? He used the word. Every time he used the word. So let's look at three things quickly we can use for comforting us in these eight verses. Number one, I want you to notice quickly the words used to describe the troubles. There's just three of them. In verse 50, he calls it affliction. Uh, this is my comfort and my affliction. And it's the word that means, it can mean poverty. It can mean misery. It can mean depression. Uh, a, a lot of people have gone through periods of depression uh, through this uh, pandemic. Uh, no doubt uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and people who are doing counseling, they have had no shortage of uh, patients and no shortage of people coming to them. We have a young lady in the church here uh, who is a professional counselor and she's talking about uh, the number of people that have been to her, usually young people, uh, and, and how some of them are depressed and going through different things. And uh, boy, it's certainly a time of the, it means poverty, misery, depression. Then in verse 51, he uses the word derision. Uh, and he says, the proud have had me greatly in derision. It means to mock or to scorn. And then the third word he uses just simply horror. Look at verse 53. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. It, listen to this. It's an interesting Hebrew word. It means a raging heat, especially a raging heat accompanied by wind. Now, you talk to those firefighters out in the West where they're battling all those forest fires, and they'll tell you one of the worst enemies of a fire is wind. And so it's talking about a raging fire that's accompanied by wind. But it can also mean this. Think about it psychologically or spiritually. It can also mean a wind of anger, a wind of anger. Somebody who's heated, they are raging. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, horror hath taken me. He said, he said, I am raging because these people, they mock me and they scorn me. And I am just about ready. I've just about had enough. And I want you to know when you've had enough, God's always there. But I sure like to go to him before I've had enough, you know. And I think that's what we need to remember. The horror, but one of the, to me, the most horrifying things about this pandemic is its unpredictability. It's, uh, it's mystery. I, I mean, um, there's so much about it that they don't know. And I mean, they've been battling it for a year now. and There's still a lot of things about it they don't know. Uh, George Mitchell, one of our church members, uh, he had COVID. He was over at Baptist Hospital in Winston. Um, and he didn't go in with COVID, but after he was there, they found out that he had it. Uh, I'm not sure he didn't get it at the hospital. But anyway, he was at Baptist Hospital and sounded like he had a very wise doctor. The doctor told him, he said, uh, after George had been there, George ended up being there eight days. And he said, Mr. Mitchell, he said, we don't know a lot about this virus. First of all, he was honest. And then he said, but one thing we do know that if you get it, he said, it attacks the weakest part of your body. Uh, Donnie, for me, that would probably be brain. 
Right? But anyway, uh, it attacks the weakest part of your body. And that's what I'm seeing with George. It was his kidney. Uh, a few years back, he had been on dialysis and gotten over that. His kidneys had gotten better, but they were still not functioning, you know, 100% like most people's would. And that's what it attacked. For other people uh, like me, and God forbid, if I get it, it's going to attack my lungs because I've had so much respiratory trouble. You folks, some out of you out there can relate. Uh, if you have a lot of uh, colds and flu, and, and for me, it's bronchitis, uh, upper respiratory infections. And if you get a lot of those, as some people do, that's probably what it's going to attack. So that, th 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 to me, the horrifying part is the unpredictability of it. Uh, we don't know. I mean, there just seems to be no... Um, no rhyme or reason. I was talking to my good friend Wesley Price and his wife Sheila. She's a career nurse up in, in the Franklin area. And um, they, they have not had a regular worship service since last March the 15th. As a matter of fact, not even then because that's when we had to shut down. So the Wednesday night before that, they have not had a regular worship service. They do drive-in worship only and, and they're, they're loving doing that. But uh, I was talking to him just a couple of weeks ago. They, Wesley had me on speaker and he said, you know, there seems to be no rhyme or reason with this thing. And he said, Sheila and I have deduced this. He said, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it. That's what he said. Now, listen, he's a, he's a smart man. If, if you don't know Wesley and, and spend time to talk with him, you might think he's a little bit uh, just comical and goofy all the time. But Wesley is really a very sharp guy. And his wife, Sheila, even more brilliant. Uh, but they said, we've deduced that if you're going to get it, you're going to get it. And the reason they did that, they said, we haven't had worship service in 11 months. And he said, we've had people in our church that have been extremely careful, staying in limit, very limited in where they're going out and very, very careful. And they got the virus. And he said, we've had other people in Franklin that just are careless and go out and don't wear masks and uh, don't wash their hands and, you know, follow all the protocols. And they haven't gotten it. He said, there seems to be no rhyme or reason. To me, one of the most horrifying things about this, uh, this virus is how unpredictable it is. But I want you to notice, you've got all those three words there for uh, the things he was going through, the derision and, and the, the horror that he's talking about here. But notice in the time of all this that is going on, in the midst of chaos, so to speak, notice what the psalmist remember. Here again, three things. The word remember is used three times in eight verses. It basically means this, to recollect or bring to mind. That's exactly what the word remember means, right? To recollect or bring to mind. Even in the Hebrew here, same thing. Now the psalmist says he remembered two things that helped him. He remembered the Lord's judgments and he remembered his name. Now, and he said in verse 52, thy judgment, they comforted him. Now, when you think of judgments in this passage, think of verdict, Think of verdict. In other words, God has heard all the evidence and he's handed down his verdict. That's what it's talking about here. He said, Lord, I remember your judgment. I remember your verdict. I remember, Lord, that when you survey all the evidence, you always have the right call. You always have the right sentence. You always have uh, the right plea, whatever you want to call it. Lord, your judgments are always perfect. They're always pure. Uh, and your verdicts will always be right. But he said, not only have I remembered your judgment, I've remembered your name in verse 55. Look at it again. He said, I have remembered thy name, thy name, the name of the Holy One, the Holy Father. In the Old Testament, boy, you can, I've, got a, I've got a study, Anthony, I've been working on for years on the names of God on the names of God. I don't know if he'll ever let me preach it while I'm still a pastor or not. I don't know. Maybe when I'm an evangelist or, or whatever. But uh, it talks, it's a message I'm working on about the names of God. In the Old Testament, he is the almighty Jehovah God, Elohim, which means the self-existing one. He is almighty God, Jehovah Elohim. Elohim is plural. It's God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. In the New Testament, He is Jesus, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Almighty God in the person of Jesus Christ. He is God who is a spirit. He is God incarnate is what he tells us. He said, I remember thy judgments. I remember thy name. And then verse number 49, the psalmist says, we should, he gives us an instruction. We should remember the word unto thy servant. We should remember the word unto thy servant. Now, a couple of things to note here. 
I'm asking folks here, I'm asking folks watching on Facebook, are you his servant? Well, to be a servant of God, first you've got to be a, a child of God. You've got to be saved. So you can't be a servant without being in God's army, without being saved. So the first thing you've got to do to be a servant is to be a child of God. Confess your sin, repent of your sin, ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, be your Savior. And, uh, and once, you, once He is your Savior, you can be His servant. And I don't know of anything much, I, I don't know of anything a higher calling than to be a servant of the Lord. When James wrote, he called himself a servant of the Lord. He could have said, hey, when he, when he introduced that passage, he said, he could have said, hey, I'm James, the brother of Christ. I'm the brother of Jesus Christ. But he didn't open it up that way. James, a servant of the Lord. There's not much higher calling than to be a servant of the high and almighty God. So the first question is, he said, the word, thy, I remember the word to thy servant. Are you his servant? If so, are his words precious, precious to you? Do you remember his word on a regular basis? The reason we read them, the reason we study them, the reason we pray about them is so that we can remember them, meditate on them, and have them in our minds and have them in our hearts. Even when we don't have his word right in front of us, we can share his word with others. We need to remember scripture that we might share it with others. So, his word to you is the precious, holy word of God. We need to remember it. Is his word precious to you? If you remember the words of the Lord, it'll bring hope in any circumstance. I remember I worked at Gil Barco for eight years building gas pumps. I don't think they're even called Gil Barco anymore, but that's been many years ago. And there was a lady who worked across from my workstation in those last few years I was there. And when you came in to manufacturing, you came in the double doors, uh, my department was the very first one on the left, and you had to go by the supervisor's office, and then there was uh, maybe a machine or two. And you got by that, and you turned left down a main, uh, one of the main aisles, and went all the way through to the end of the shop there in manufacturing. And the lady who worked across from me, she would assemble certain kinds of small parts. She was a little short black lady, about this big, and oddly enough, her name was Short, Helen Short. And every week, Helen would put a new uh, saying, scripture, or something on her desk. And most often, it was something that was very scriptural. And she, and one time she put this on her desk, I still remember. She said, Christians should never be overcome by circumstances. They should overcome the circumstances with their faith in God. I like that. They should overcome the circumstances, no matter what they are. No matter what they are, overcome the circumstances with your faith in God. And one of the ways we remember our faith in God and, and depend on our faith is God, in God is to remember His precious Word and how we can use it in any circumstance in our life. So he says, I remembered, I remembered, and I want you to remember is what he's saying here. If you'll focus on God and His Word, I believe we can get through any circumstance that the devil throws at us. Lastly, not only notice in what the song, not only those three words that talk about how chaotic it was, and then notice in what the psalmist remembered, but notice the benefits of remembering God's word, the benefits of remembering God's word. Verse 49 says, it causes us to hope. Now remember the word hope here means patiently and trustfully wait, and if we patiently and trustfully wait on the Lord to do what He does best, He will deliver us. I believe that. I believe He'll deliver us from this pandemic if we will call on Him and trust in Him and pray to Him and patiently wait upon the Lord to deliver us. You know what Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait patiently upon the Lord. Not only does it cause us to have hope, but his word gives us new life. It says in verse 50, thy word hath quickened me. That word quickened means to make alive to make alive. Now think about some things here. God gave us physical life 
when we were born. Had it not been for God giving me life and breath, I would not have been born. But not only that, not just us as individuals, but God gave life to mankind when he, when he formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And it says he formed him out of the, out of the by the way, the name Adam, Hebrew, Adam, means uh, red dirt because he was made from the red dirt. And so God forms him out of the dust of the ground, out of the dirt of the, of the earth. And, uh, and it says he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So he gave all of mankind life. And uh, some of these idiots up in Washington, if they would realize that the Lord gave them life and he's sustaining their life, they might call out to him. But they're just going around hopelessly, helplessly, not calling upon the name of the Lord. But I'm just simply saying, he's the one that gave them life. He's the one that gave me life. He's the one that gave life to all mankind, physical life. But not only that, he gave us spiritual life when we were born again. Somebody say amen in the building. I'm telling you, he gave us spiritual life when we were born again. But not, not only that third thing about him giving us new life, God gives us a new sense of life, a new sense of what our life is all about when we remember his word, when we remember his word. When you read and study and meditate upon the Word of God and pray about it, you'll realize more every time you read it that it is, Tyler, it's not about me. It's all about Him. And I think what I need to be asking myself as a preacher, as a pastor, as a father, as a grandfather, as a husband, as a Christian, what I need to be asking myself doing through all this pan pandemic Lord, what can I do, even in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, what can I do to, to glorify your holy name? Because we don't want to lose focus. We as Christians, we don't want to lose focus. Remember, the number one priority of a Christian is to glorify the Lord. Uh, and, and we don't ever want to be strayed away from that. We don't ever want to stray away from that. I remember a story uh, uh, about a, 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 a father who always had devotions with his kids and so on and so forth. And uh, and they'd be sitting around do, reading their Bible and all kinds of, you know, this kind of thing. And, uh, and he would ask the, the children, he said, he said, children, what's our number one responsibility? He said, glorify the Lord. And every night he would ask, what's our number one goal? Glorify the Lord. Well, one night uh, they hadn't had time to have their, uh, no, I take that back. They just had their devotion. They had all gone to bed. And in the middle of the night, a fire broke out in the house. Now they had an escape plan and everything well organized. And so they had a place that all the family was to meet when they got out of the house under a big tree out in the front yard near the road. And they all got out, all the family got out, mom, dad, and the two or three kids, and they're all under that chair. And the firemen are coming and they're watching their house burn. There's nothing they can do about it. And he looked at those kids and was trying to comfort them. He said, children, I want to ask you a question. He said, he said, what is our number one goal as Christians? And one of the little boys looked up and said, kind of puzzled, he said, glorify the Lord. And dad said, yeah, that's right. He said, dad, how can we glorify the Lord? Our house is burning. He said, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. That's still our number one goal. Is to, he said, we can thank God. We can glorify the Lord and thank him and praise him that we got all, out of, all got out of the house and we're safe. Things can be replaced, but my children are safe. My wife is safe. Nothing's changed. Hey, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of the corona and the corruption and all that's going on, we can still remember that our number one goal as Christians is to glorify the Lord. He gives us physical life, spiritual life, a new sense of what our life is all about. But verse 52 says he gives us comfort. The psalmist said, I remember thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Comforted myself. Question. Do you seek God's word? Do you ever seek God's word just for the comfort that it brings? I do. There have been times, if you watch, I haven't done it lately, but I used to do this a lot. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be a time of chaos, something going on, something crazy in the church, whatever. And uh, Pat, I'd just get my Bible and I'd go up and down the hallway at church reading, just reading my Bible out loud. I figured that just made the devil mad for one thing. You know, and, and I just walk up and down the hallway reading my Bible, uh, making the devil mad. But it comforted me. Of course, certain passages more than others. Psalm 23 is a good one. We think about comfort, the great shepherd, and I mean, the good shepherd and all that. And uh, of course, Psalm 34, one of my favorites. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall sometimes be in my mouth. Is that what it says? 
No, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Good times, bad times, in between time, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Do you ever see God's word just for the comfort it brings? Well, we know our world's in chaos right now, but I don't hear a lot of leaders and politicians talking about getting back to God's word. Oh, we're going we're gonna to develop a, a, a vaccine and it's going to solve everything. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Uh, wear masks. You know, they say wear the mask. That's going to do good. And I, I, maybe it does. I wear my mask when I come in. I wear my mask when I go out. I wear it when I go out in public. Anywhere I wear it. I don't know if it's doing any good or not, but I'm wearing it because they told me to wear it, you know. And, uh, but uh, I know one thing that will do some good, and that's calling out to God. I know that'll do some good. Uh, you know, so many of these things that they're trying, they're untested, but God's word is not untested. It's what well, I should say. It's been tested, been tried, but it's been proven over and over and over and over again. And it works and it works every time if you use God's word according to his word. No, none of the leaders seem to be very concerned about God or his word. But I remember what Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to turn back and read it right now. What, remember there was a time when the three Hebrew children were all thrown into fire and Daniel, you know, wasn't there at the time. He'd been on a mission and so on and so forth. But we, we hear this story in Daniel chapter 2. The king had had a dream and he had all these wise men and soothsayers and fortune tellers and all this kind of stuff. They're supposed to be the best in the land because Babylon was probably the most powerful uh, place on the face of the earth at that time. And he would have had the best of the best. But he had a dream and he, he knew it disturbed him, but he woke up and he couldn't remember the dream. And he said, get the, get the wise men, the soothsayers. I want them to tell me what the dream was and what it meant. And of course, none of them could do it. Oh, King, you tell us what the dream is and we'll tell you what it means. And none of them could do it. Uh, and they said, it's an unfair thing that you ask of us. And so uh, he said, man, if you, don't, if you don't tell me what's going on here, if you don't tell me what my dream was, he said, I'm going to have you all killed. And they think they're doomed, but they, somebody remembered Daniel. They go get Daniel and they bring Daniel in. And in verse 26 of chapter 2, the king answered and said unto Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, talking to Daniel, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I've seen and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel answered, I love the way he answers, in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But listen. He said, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the, in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. He said, hey, all these wise men, all these politicians, all these Democrats, all these Republicans, all these libertarians, they don't know what's going on. They can't tell you anything. But I want to remind our people, and I want to remind the people, whoever are looking at this uh, by social media, there is a God in heaven. And if we'll cry out to him, and if we'll consult his word, and pursue his word, and pray over his word, I believe that he will deliver us from this. Because the psalmist said, I cried unto the Lord, and he delivered me from all of my fears and he delivered me from all of my troubles and I believe if God's people would honestly cry out to him I believe he would deliver us we can have hope in the midst of hopelessness if we cry out to God and I want to remind our people not to be guilty of the things that the rest of the nation is guilty of and not consulting the Lord. I understand it, I guess, Robbie, when politicians uh, don't consult the Lord because, uh, and I'm not judging, but uh, if, if any of them are saved, and I know some of them are, but if they're, some of them, if they're saved, they're certainly not producing godly fruit. We know that. And, and so we know there's a lot of them that aren't saved. And so it's not a surprise when unsaved politicians don't consult the Lord. But it would be a shame for saved people, the members of Community Baptist Church, uh, the members of this community that are saved, it would be a shame for us not to call upon the name of the Lord. But I want to tell you something, folks. There's better days coming. There's better days are coming. Uh, I was thinking about this as I was walking this morning, and I'll close with this and then pray. But uh, there's a better time of coming. It's the old song, Higher Ground, 319 in the 1956 
blue-gray Baptist hymnal. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim, is higher ground. I want to live above the world. Praise God. Though Satan's darts, I read about those in Ephesians 16. I want to live above the world. Though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound. The song of saints on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height. And catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I've found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. <laughs> There's a better day coming. And the way to get there is a relationship with God and reading this precious, precious book. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And one of the ways he orders or guides or directs our ways is through his precious word. Let's get back to the book. Get our nose in there. At least to what used to say, get your nose in the word and keep it there. And I think that's what we need to do right now. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your precious word. I thank you that we can find comfort in the midst of chaos in your precious, precious word. We can find hope in a world that seems hopeless, we can find hope in our relationship with you and we can find hope in your precious word. I'm so thankful, God, that we are not left alone. You said you would never leave us, you would never forsake us, and if we'd call out to you, you'd hear us and deliver us. And that's what we're doing right now, Lord. We're crying out to you, calling out to you, and asking you, Lord, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I believe praying in the will of the Father that you would uh, get a hold of the hearts of the leaders of this country and help them to see that our best hope, our only hope, is to call upon you. Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege I've had to preach this morning. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, as we dismiss this service, and try to get a little rest this afternoon. Lord, you bring us back tonight, ready to serve you and to worship you again. For it's in Christ's name I do pray for his sake. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Lord willing, see you back again tonight. Take care.